Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hello and welcome back. This is Michael Cashew and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. Today or this week, I've got a guy named Daniel Vitalis on the show with me. Daniel is a modern day hunter gatherer. He is a registered main guide and he's also a very successful speaker and entrepreneur. He's founded WildFed, SirThrival.com and has been the host of a super popular podcast called the Rewild Yourself Podcast. The main topic of today's episode is what it means to be wild versus domesticated as human beings. And we talk a lot about the decisions that we've made as a species that have caused us to become soft for lack of a better term. Uh, We talk about coming to grips with our own mortality so that we can have gratitude for our lives in the present moment and just to be more present in general. And Daniel throughout the show talks about his own experience with rewilding himself as he calls it and gives us some very approachable ways uh, to do the same. In general, Daniel is helping us to become more human and to connect with ourselves and the world around us much, much more. So without further ado, please help me welcome Daniel Vitalis. Daniel Vitalis, the wild man. What's up, brother? Yeah, it's a funny introduction because it's like, (laughs) you know, I'm very aware of my own domestication, I think more than my wildness, but then I guess it depends who you compare me against, but, uh, relatively, relatively, yeah, relatively wild. You're wild as shit. (laughs) Wild as some shit. Yeah. It's so, it's such a uh, pleasure to be here with you, man. Uh, we have some really good mutual friends that have been talking you up for quite a while. I finally looked into your podcast. I think you stopped doing the rewild a couple years ago, but you have Mm -hmm, some fascinating stuff on there and I'm just stoked to be here with you, man. seems like we have a lot of overlap on the psychology side of things. It's just something I'm really interested in. And, uh, it seems like that's something you, you and your community are interested in too. So, um, yeah, it's, I'm excited to talk to you today. That's a good, that's a good starting place because I want to understand how you develop some of the psychology that you have. Um, I know that you had quite a troubled, um, childhood. Your dad abandoned you. Your mom had mental illness. And yet here you are, you've become a successful entrepreneur and thought leader in the health space. So I'd like to start here. What are, what are a couple of the most important lessons that you learned from either your parents or through your just experience in childhood? Oh, we're jumping right in deep, huh? All the way. <laughs> <laughs> no warm up, no loop. Okay. So I think that uh, when I look back on my own kind of story holistically, I find it amusing almost that my focus is on this idea of wildness because I think uh, sometimes about those wild child stories, you'll see sometimes I've seen a couple documentaries on this or you'll read these stories about like kids who who are found like living in the wild where they were abandoned by their parents or they were like um, maybe like uh, raised in part by animals. Like this is a real phenomenon that occasionally happens. And uh, then they have a, a really difficult time reintegrating those people. And sometimes they miss critical points where their language doesn't fully develop and they can't reintegrate them into society. You know, mm-hmm. they're like truly wild, like a wild child. That's a wow. real phenomenon. Okay, uh, I'm not that. But uh, because of how I was raised, I didn't get all of the um, social norms instilled in me quite correctly. Or I maybe not correctly, but the way that is you know, culturally normal to do. Standard and traditional. Yeah. And so because of that, I developed a lot of my own ways of doing things, my own ways of thinking about things, my own ways of seeing the world. Now, sometimes to my detriment, but often to my benefit. So when I look back and I see this, like I, that I teach about human wildness, essentially, it's amusing to me because I was sort of abandoned as a young person. Mm -hmm. And that is the shadow of one of those wild child stories. And so my interest in wildness in part comes from the fact that like you mentioned, my dad, um, my dad, who's actually is really fascinating. I don't know him. Um, he's a very successful scientist. Wow. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's a professor. Uh, he's a, you know, a PhD, um, in paleontology and he's out there teaching and he has a wife, no other kids, me and my brother only. And, uh, yeah, he's out there and he's got two sons and for somehow he just doesn't care. I mean, um, it just boggles my mind. I really don't understand it. But um, 
you know, so he left and, and my mom, as you mentioned, struggled with mental illness my whole life. And so I was raised with some kind of crazy stories, particularly like alien abduction type stories and things wow. like that, uh, which are juicy stories. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> the, you know, you know how like uh, if you hear about like, let's say this is often I'll hear this like uh, uh, an actor who believes in some some kind of, you know, cryptozoology phenomenon. And it'll be like, if it's somebody you know really well or somebody whose work you really respect, it, it adds validity to that story a little bit. So mm -hmm. once your mom and she's telling you about those things, it, it's hard to sort out what's real from not real. So I grew up uh, kind of very confused about what was real, or at least my, with my mind very open to some strange possibilities. Um, it took me a while to sort that stuff out. So here I am today, you know, eventually having figured out how to make a life for myself. And by some standards, I uh, have been really successful at it. Um, but I mean, it's been a journey, man, and it's been painful. And unpacking a lot of it has been hard. And uh, I am good at like you know communicating socially, but I'm also pretty reclusive at the same time because like you know y you wrestle with shadows or whatever. Totally, man. Uh, this the, the, these challenges in your youth. Do you feel like that's driven you to excel and achieve to a certain degree? Um, I'm not like a competitive person against other people really, uh, but I'm very, um, I drive myself pretty hard and that came out of necessity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if I didn't do that, cause one of the things too, is when you're like an abandoned kid, you get, um, you groups of kids often like they need like a scapegoat kid. You know, the one that they're going to like dump everything on, the one they're going to kick around, like the one they use to ease the tensions in the group. And I got to be that kid for a lot of my life. And so, you know, partially it was like survival mechanism about that. And part of it was if I wasn't going to go through the traditional school route, um, I did not want to be, um, I didn't want to be poor. You know, I grew up poor and that really sucked, man. I just, you know, I had this tattoo artist when I was young and I remember he had on his wall, it said, poor is for suckers. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of true, you know, and I, I didn't want to be poor. I wanted to, uh, but I also don't care about being wealthy. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't really care about being like real successful either. I think that can be a real trap. I mean, I've gotten to having, you know, I spent about a decade on the teaching circuit and speaking around the country, around Canada and the U.S. and um, got to do some stuff internationally and all that. And I have got to watch a lot of well-known entrepreneurs in the sort of, personal development space mm -hmm. and see what the sacrifice they make to be at the top. And I just don't really care about that. Yeah. And I think that's partially from my childhood too, because I wasn't taught like how important it would be to be, you know, like to be a doctor or be a lawyer or be at the top of my field. No one ever taught me about that. And I've always felt like I would rather, <clears throat> like when I had my podcast, I was like, man, I'd rather hover around like, you know, number 40 than fight for like number one in two spaces. Mm -hmm. Because what you give up for that I don't think you look back on your life, you know, just, just a couple, just a personal short story, a couple, uh, about a week and a half ago, I was in Canada, uh, and I watched a man who's 95, um, choose to die at home with his family. Mm -hmm. Uh, so up there you can, you know, make a conscious choice for euthanasia essentially. And this is not a person who was really sick, but at his age, his body systems were starting to shut down and he was losing quality of life. And I think he chose, you know, I'd rather die at home. Mm -hmm. And so... I watched this guy say goodbye to everybody. Wow. And then I watched these injections happen and him pass away in front of us. You know, it was really powerful confrontation with mortality, you know, really heavy death reminder. I mean, it's been sitting heavy on me for like the last couple of weeks. I've wow. been, you know, because death reminders, right? There's a lot of really good uh, psychological work on this of how behaviors change and psychology changes in a person when you give them a death reminder. And so, you know, because so much of what we're doing day to day is to avoid dealing with our mortality, mm -hmm. right? So when you're confronted with it like that, right, it sits kind of heavy and makes you think about what's important. You see somebody going like that and it's not about like, were you the top spot or number two in iTunes? You know what I mean? It doesn't totally, matter. Man, totally. It's not about like wh where you ranked in your field, really. It just isn't right. about that. You see that it's suddenly reduced down to relationships. It's suddenly re reduced down to who you love and who loved you. And did you do good work in the world? And, and did you um, do the things that actually mattered in your heart more mm. than mattered in your head? I think I got that from early on because I, you know, the way I was raised, I didn't expect to like live a long life, really. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was like, well, I'm just not going to do the things that I don't want to do. So the things, I guess to wrap that up, what I'm trying to say is the things that I did that have brought me success are because they were the things I wanted to do, not because they were the things that I felt I had to do. And I am probably pretty well known amongst my friends, though they don't ever tell me about it, but (laughs) I'm probably pretty well known for having sabotaged some big opportunities that have come Mm -hmm. my way. You know, I had a really nice book deal um, and I ended up giving the money back. You know, I had an opportunity for a, a show on a very major network, turned it down, you know, because things didn't feel right. And I just, I think partially being raised the way I was, it was like every moment is important. And I'm not really interested in going down paths where um, I'm sacrificing what I actually care about. I don't, just don't want to look back on my life and be like, oh, oops. Yeah. That wasn't what was important. Right. That's one of the most powerful, powerful perspectives I've heard in a while, man. Uh, I'm immediately thinking back to some of those moments for me where I had this, uh, I don't know, realization that I was focusing on the wrong things, big car crash, recovering from drug addiction, Mm -hmm. having a loved one either pass away or, or get, um, like hit by a car or something. All of a sudden, just like in an instant, you realize what really matters to you. What are some of the other things that are, what are some good death reminders that people can't like, are there any habits or, um, tactics people can use to kind of snap themselves out of this trance? (laughs) I can't speak for what other people can do, but I can tell you something that I do, which is that I kill things, uh, cause I hunt and I hunt pretty aggressively, which means I'm hunting all year whenever I can. And when I can, I'm fishing <clears throat> now I forage too. So I'm big into harvesting plants, mushrooms, algae. So I, in other words, I say that because I'm, I'm taking food from all these different kingdoms, right? And uh, I was just talking with somebody about this recently. I feel like if you think about sort of how a vitamin deficiency works, you know, like if you're deficient in a vitamin, then you're going to start to exhibit symptoms of and signs of disease. And all you need is that nutrient. And then all of a sudden, those things will clear up. But if you didn't know that, you might try to treat all those symptoms, right? You might be like, ah, I, you know, you don't realize it's vitamin C deficiency. You just see bleeding gums Mm -hmm. and you're trying to treat the bleeding gums and not realizing that what you actually need is just this one nutrient, right? Um, I think if you aren't around death, dying and killing, then there's something just, just based on human Uh, history and biology. This is a tough conversation too, because a lot of people have done a lot of work to avoid ever seeing that stuff. Right. So they, this would sound so contrary to common sense, but if you look at human history, which in our current form might be something like 300,000 years, it seems to me that the trend in archeology span and paleontology, you know, as it applies to anthropology is that these dates get pushed back all the time. They don't ever get moved forward. Then we're not ever going to hear, oh, turns out we're younger as a species than we thought. Right. It's usually that we're older. So, um, you know, it was 200,000 years ago, two years ago. Now it's 300,000 years. So we've been in this modern form. So let's say that we have a 300,000 year history and then we have something like three and a half million years as hominins. So uh, during that time, like how many days would go by before you either killed something or saw something be killed? I mean, we're talking, this is daily basis stuff Mm -hmm. because you got to eat, you know? Then human history trucks along basically on a pretty steady course until something like 14,000 years ago when agriculture starts. During the agricultural revolution, human beings start settling down into encampments. They are living more of an agrarian life in certain parts of the world. But even then, you know, it's still like things are dying all the time. People are dying all the time. Infant mortality rates are like 50% naturally for people. That's our natural infant mortality rate, you know? I mean, we have this interesting thing in our culture because there's this like uh, sense of there's something wrong with that. Like, oh no, 50% of the babies die. I mean, it's horrible. Think about it. But then at the same time, people will turn around and be like, there are way too many people. This overpopulation right. thing's out of hand. It's like, well, which, which one is it? I mean- right. It's pretty obvious here kind of what's the one of the issues. But but naturally, we lose half the babies. Now, I, I'm not cold about that. I mean, I have personally lost five babies to miscarriage now and recently wow. saw one as a very, very small human fetus um, oh, b- birth. I mean, very intense experience um, being with that and putting that baby in the ground. And so I'm not, I, wow. and, uh, you know, I lost a niece at 30 days. I have, a, uh, friends who lost a baby on the day it was born. Um, I have a friend who lost a baby a year in. So, you know, 
I know about infant mortality, so I, I don't want to sound cold here. But I'm just pointing out that these were normal experiences. Now when they happen, we act like they're aberrations, right? So people are so removed from death. It's so shuttered away. Mm -hmm. And when and very few of us ever see anyone die or anything die aside from like things that we don't really think about as alive, like mosquitoes and such. So mm -hmm. my point is when you start hunting, if, especially if you didn't grow up doing it, suddenly you're confronted with mortality all the time. And the bigger an animal gets and the more warm-blooded it is, the more um, anthropomorphic, or the more we anthropomorphize it. So The more uh, we can kind of relate to it. Exactly. Exactly. Particularly an animal like a deer yep. or a bear. When you look it in the eye, you just feel uh, a kinship and watching the sort of life ebb out of something. Um, and then butchering that animal and going like, oh, there's a heart, just like my heart. Maybe the same size as my heart. There's kidneys. There's a liver. Like, this is what I am inside. You know, breaking that animal down. There comes a point where you're like, oh, now I'm looking at what looks like supermarket food. But from that moment, from the moment it dies to the moment it looks like supermarket food, you are confronted with your mortality. You're like, this is me. This is like what I am. And how it makes you sort of wrestle with what your consciousness is. Is it like a divine thing? Is it a evolutionary uh, event that took place? How do we get this level of self-awareness? You're either way, physically, we're no different than these animals. And so right. you're confronted with that all the time. And it makes you realize how finite your life is, no matter what you do. I have gone so deep. I've gone deeper probably than most people will ever go down the like, can I eat my way to immortality? Can I exercise my way to immortality or cleanse and fast my way or yoga my way or go to India my way to immortality. Like, is there mm -hmm. something I can do to extend my life, you know, um, which is the running from death, but is also probably also a good thing to do, right? We all want right. to live healthier and we all want more quality in whatever amount of years we have. So I right. think it's a good thing to do. But at the same time, I think there's a pathological bend to it and you can take it too far. And I've definitely done that. And eventually you step back and you start looking at the people who have inspired you to do that as they get older. Because typically the people who we want to follow, whose work we want to follow, right there, been on the path longer than us. They've been alive longer. They've been around the sun more times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you watch them. You, I'm turning 41 this week. So the, a lot of the people who were inspiring me in diet, nutrition, exercise, you know, they're in their 50s and 60s now. And you're like, man, they're aging like everybody else. They, mm -hmm. Sometimes you're like, no, oh, they look pretty good for 65 or whatever right, it is. Right. But then I know other people that look really good for 65 don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And eventually you're like, oh, you can't cheat it. There's no way around it. All you can do is try to really increase the quality every single day and make sure you're doing those things that give you that quality. Because you just can't, you just don't know what will happen. I mean, I think sometimes about, you know, when you shoot an animal, it's like, they don't even, if they die quickly, they don't hear a gunshot, right? The bullet's faster than sound. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just one minute you're eating grass, the next minute you're gone. It's just, it just happens. So it's like, just, you know, that's one lesson I learned from hunting is I'm confronted with mortality. And, and you were asking like, what can other people do? It's like, man, put a skull on your counter, put a skull on your desk. That's the old alchemical way is you keep a skull around, this little reminder. You know, they got, you know, like you travel down to Mexico and they've got, you know, the Day of the Dead and it's like uh, a reminder. You see skulls everywhere. It's like just a reminder. Not skulls like scary, ooh, bad, poison, but more like happy dancing skulls like, hey, we're all going to the same place. So don't forget it because if you forget it, it's like a pathology and you start to display weird symptoms. And all of those like running from death things I was talking about before, those are like symptoms of it. You know, it's like a deficiency of confrontation with death. And so right. I think I think it, it's scary, but confronting it is really healing. So it's like getting vitamin C when you have scurvy. And then suddenly you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I'm going to just use my time here. Right. Yeah, man. I'm, I've, uh, I was telling you about uh, my friend Monzo before the show. Monzo Denton has been on the, uh, I think he... We had an episode a few a few weeks ago. Anyway, we talked a lot about this same topic, and I realized that I've been hunting my entire life, but I I, I never saw it through this lens. And I'm just so excited because you go, grew up doing because you grew up doing it exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was just it wasn't treated with the same level of respect as it is in the way that you're talking about it. And so yeah. I I never had much of a 
it was it was never a profound or powerful experience. It was just pure fun to me. Mm. And I can see all of the I could see all of the lessons that you're talking about um, just kind of waiting to appear to me if I go in with it, go yeah. in with a different intention. Yeah, but also you might just be a little more grounded in it too. It's probably a good thing. I wish I'd grown up doing it. <laughs> Even if I had had a different perspective. I mean, I'm like grateful for what I have, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I also, I'm scrambling to catch up a bit too, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. on a lot of things that I didn't learn growing up. Right. So, so, I mean, the fact that it's integrated into you is probably a, not a bad thing. <laughs> Probably not a bad thing. Um, your friend you were just talking about, I think he has uh, worked with entheogens quite a bit though too, right? Yes, it's part of his yes. journey. Yeah, there, there's another one. It's like, I remember the first time that I smoked DMT from, you know, I used to go down to Arizona a lot and uh, hang on at hot springs. And the hot springs create this environment that is a bit reminiscent of the summer monsoons there. So the bufo toads will come out, even though it's not the monsoon. Um, and the bufo toad is this toad that you, you know, Maybe you're familiar, but you, you catch this toad up and flip him upside down and squeeze his glands onto mm -hmm. a plate or something, and then you just scrape this stuff up, and you and your friends like smoke it, and and the the moment it's in your lungs, like you're already out of your body, and for about ninety seconds, you know, you go through what might as well be thirty years of experience is how right. it can feel, you know. And the first time I did it, it was like I died. I, I went through the process of accepting have you ever had an experience where i've had it underwater before i was um in the amazon in the madre de dios river and uh floating down with a bunch of people just in, in wearing pfds and just floating down this river and uh i just got yanked under by this um eddy and suspended sort of arms out legs out just held in place in maybe about four or five feet underwater and uh i couldn't move and i just Damn. everybody just keeps going you know and I'm like, nobody's even seen that this just happened. And then that's the first thought. That's terrifying. And then, and then it's like, I can't, I can't even move. It's like I'm in cement. And then very quickly, like I'm talking like in a, in a second, you go through, time doesn't make sense in this way because suddenly you process a huge amount of stuff very quickly, like accepting that you're going to die. And you, in the accepting, it takes a minute, you know what I mean? But it happens in this compressed period of time. So it's like, okay, I'm going to die. Oh, that really sucks. No, that's okay. Wow, my life's been great. Then all the life kind of flashes in front <laughs> oh, of you, all these shit, stuff. Man. And then all of a sudden, I just get like spit out of the eddy and I'm back on top. Yeah. And everybody's just still laughing and high-fiving and like, this is so great. And everyone's looking at me and I'm like, you know, I'm just like, look, shell-shocked and yeah. nobody knows why. And I've just had this experience that nobody's aware that just happened. Um, like that, you know, DMT just like, boy, just make peace with death. And then I think if you, you choose to use medicines in this way, because I mean, obviously they can be used in a lot of different ways and they vary recreationally or they can be used very um, therapeutically or you know, however you choose to approach it, but, but you can approach it as a practice in dying. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really powerful because uh, again, watching this, this man die recently, he could have chosen to stay and he would have probably lived another year, I bet. At least half a year, no, no question. He mentally perfectly clear, right? Right. Um, he went out, by the way, listening to um, Sinatra's "I Did It My Way." Amazing. Which I was just, which was just, I mean, wow. I thought it was very classy, but, um, but there was a moment where I saw him watching to see, like, how is he going to respond to what's happening? And he, for a moment, there's that you could see it, like, wait, maybe I shouldn't do this. And then I saw him just like take this breath and be like. <sighs> no, I'm going for it. You know, he'd committed. It was an appointment. Like the doctor's coming, everyone's there. Like he just decides wow. like, no, steals himself internally. You know, I just think like the medicines can give you an opportunity to practice that, mm -hmm. you know? So it'd be kind of like, I guess maybe like astronauts when they go on those planes where they drop them and they get the experience of zero G's. And they kind mm -hmm. of get the feeling of weightlessness, but they're not really in space. It's like the medicines, I get the impression, you know, I mean, that you get the practice. That of sounds dying, accurate. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Guys, if you're interested in learning more about this, there's a great documentary on Netflix called The God Molecule. Uh, and Joe Rogan hosts this um, like hour, hour and a half long documentary about uh, this substance Daniel's talking about DMT. Yeah, that's great, man. Uh, yeah, powerful you, you're, you're one of the most grounded people that I think I've ever met. Um, and you, you really seem like you're living in your calling or your Dharma even. What oh, are some of the decisions that you've made that have gotten you to this place where you're just, just so focused on what you're doing? 
Yeah, well, I'm a pretty defiant person, so I'm not. I wouldn't want anyone to like necessarily follow this journey, you know, the way that I did things. But, but um, I school was not for me, and I made a decision to get out of school really early. So I finished um, seventh grade, eighth grade, kind of did. I kind of went to junior high, um, and then I didn't go to high school. Of course, you you always hear from people that that's like a really bad decision to make. And I think for a lot of people, it can be a really bad decision. But for me, it was the right decision. And it was the first, one of the first times where it was like, I decided to take a really alternative path. Everybody around me telling me that's a bad idea. And it was right for me, you know? Um, that was the right choice for me. I left a lot of like jobs where people were like, no, man, this is a really good path you're on. You should stick to this. And I was like, well, it doesn't feel right. And I like, mm -hmm. leave it. And then new doors open. And as an entrepreneur, like I said before, I've made a lot of choices like where I've said no to things that looked really good. And um, people, you know, it's not hard to say yes, man. It's hard to say no. Mm -hmm. You know, setting boundaries is really hard. And it's especially hard because of the deep levels of codependency people have. You know, there's interdependencies, like that's all of us, right? But codependency, that like clingy kind of like, don't leave me behind, right. that like greedy fear feeling or the hungry ghost sensation or whatever that we have. Um, like learning how to trust yourself and walk away from things, I think is really, really important. It's as important as knowing how to tough it out when mm -hmm. it's time to stick to something. So it's like, there's a difference, right? There's a difference between I'm doing a job, I'm in a relationship, I'm in a, uh, I don't know, like a partnership or business where it doesn't feel right. And there, that's different than I don't want to do my workout today, but I'm going to grind it out. Mm -hmm. Like knowing how to sort through those two different things. Like, is this my inner voice right. that's telling me that this is the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. Or is this my inner saboteur trying to trip me up because it wants the easy road? And yeah, that's knowing how to listen. Well, I mean, if you can have, if you can have that discernment, you know, um, so there's been a lot of people too, who've come along and who it looked like they were going to help me, you know, in my success, but you just sense like they're, they're actually want to like use you for their success. Mm. You know what I mean? Yep. And knowing when to like walk away from those things have been really crucial to me. And I think part of that comes from, like I said, I mean, I kind of grew up very alone, very isolated. So I'm really comfortable in my aloneness. Um, you know, I mean, I'm married now. I have an amazing wife who, I mean, has been probably the uh, most instrumental part of my healing journey. You know, she's mm -hmm. a, uh, she's like basically like special needs teacher, you know, in what Canada calls, she's from Canada, they call it resource teaching up there here. They'd call it sort of like a special ed. Mm -hmm. She works with like kids who have trauma. So, you know, I have this wife who kind of can work with me like a kid who has trauma because wow. I'm just a grown up version of the kids that she's trained to work with. Um, and that's been really beneficial. But like I said, like I, I'm very comfortable um, walking away from things because I had to. And when you grow up at the street level, like, boy, it's like um, everybody feeding on each other. You know, it's, I, I don't know how it is to be raised sort of at a higher socioeconomic level, but at the mm -hmm. low levels, everybody's just devouring each other. It's very predatory. Yeah. And that's given me a very keen sense of unsafe scenarios. So I'll be with people sometimes and I'll just be amazed at the unsafe things that they do. The unsafe people they'll let approach them, the um, opportunities that they'll take that you're like, man, you are stepping into a trap. How do you mm -hmm. not see that? But I see it because I was raised around so much danger that like you get very keenly aware of what a, a predator in disguise is like. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so, like I said, I think sometimes knowing uh, when to walk away from things and when things are unsafe or when not to walk into things mm -hmm. might be a better way to say that. You know, it just comes from being around trauma. I mean, again, like looking back at human history, trauma is pretty normal. You know, who wouldn't have had pretty, it? Pretty universal. Pretty it's just universal. Like the, the, the degree to which you're traumatized, right? Yeah, yeah. Or like how much your trauma contrasts against what's become the social norm, mm. right? So if, if people have been, I mean, if you took a, a, a lion raised in the zoo and you threw that lion out to live with lions raised in the wild, you know what I mean? Like that lion raised in the zoo would be really unfit for that environment. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the lion in the wild is unfit for the zoo environment, right? They're both adapted to their niches. So in that way, like um, I kind of was in this wilds 
And now that I live in, you know, a higher socioeconomic bracket and I pay my taxes and I have a, you know, a day-to-day kind of work gig and all the stuff that I do today, it's like being in the zoo a little bit more. Everybody's so tame and so docile, you know what I mean? And I kind of carry the knowledge of what it's like to be out in the wild a little bit in that sense, metaphorically. So, I mean, I think to the animals in the zoo, the animals from the wild would be really traumatized, except what's actually the biological norm. It's being in the wild. So I think that uh, a lot of us have been through terrible traumas, and I'm not saying that's a good thing at all. I don't mean that. But we've also gotten so soft now that most people can't actually handle reality anymore. And so there's got to be some balance in there, I think. Right? Because you, you, how many people have you seen who they had a hardship, they had a hardship as kids, and so they want to really like avoid that for their own children, Mm-hmm. And then they raise those like really annoying trust fund kids who can't do anything, get out of their own way and are just constant drain on the system. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And squander the resources that were gathered together by their parents. Right. It's like a really common story. Like if you make things too easy for somebody, it doesn't make them better. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's an, it, looking back on my life, I certainly would not wish trauma on somebody else. No, but... At the same time, I think everybody needs to, if, if you have a life that is free of trauma, then you probably need to subject yourself to some hardships. Right. Like maybe it's just like, hey, I'm going to go do Tough Mudder this year and I'm going to, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to do some fasting and I'm going to get a tattoo or whatever it is. You got to like make sure that you have initiatory hardship. That's crucial. Um, it doesn't have to be stuff that leaves you with deep emotional scars. That would be better if it didn't. Right, but but you you got it. I mean, it's just like your your know, your musculoskeletal and fascial systems need to be strength trained. Right, if they you're need not, stress to recover they bigger need and better stress. and faster. Exactly, uh, that's how you become resilient. It's how you adapt, and that's how you get longevity. So I'm very suspect of people who've had really soft lives and uh, who uh, curate soft lives. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I'm reading the book Anti Fragile right now. Do you sure. know it? Yeah. 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 Um, so. For those of you who haven't read that, fragile obviously means um, something that's in a state that is easily disturbed or broken or shattered. And in Western culture, you know, and in many parts of the world, we have these very cush, comfortable lives that have made us fragile. And a lot of that is, um, you know, it brings a lot of pleasure and things like that to our lives, but it also makes it so that when life happens as it will at some point to all of us, you know, some, some big challenges thrown our way, we're just not ready for it. So I'm, I'm also a huge proponent of proactive, as big as you can handle challenges, things that really, really scare you and, um, let you know that you're, you're made of much more than you even think possible. My wife's used to now, we were the other day, out foraging and it's starting to get cold here in Maine now um, because we're into September and we pull up our canoe on the riverbank at a nice sandy area and she did not grow up doing the kind of things that I grew up doing you know so she's sees me starting to take my clothes off and she's like ah she just does it now you know in the past I would have to like coax her in it's like that water looks cold so we are going to get in that water Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's cold because after the second we step out you're going to feel so vivified and so renewed and all your your metabolic systems are going to turn on and you'll be flushed with like overwhelming life force you know as your body wakes up to that experience because here we are canoeing and this is a beautiful, perfect, sunny day in the fall and everything. And then all of a sudden this shock and your body just bounces back so good. So th- that's like the kind of thing that I think, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to be emotional childhood trauma. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's like, oh, cold water, let's get in it. Oh, hot sauna, let's get in it. Oh, let's do some hard work today. Let's delay pleasure a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. it's like if you like having a drink, right, and it feels good, it's like, okay, well, stretch a few days before you have your next one. And that one will feel really good when you have it. But if you just have it every day, then it doesn't feel as good anymore. It starts to dull out and you start to, it starts to become normalcy. So it's important to create not just discomfort, but also delay comfort sometimes. Yeah. Because then when you don't have it, it ruins your day Mm -hmm. because you're so used to it. Yeah. And you're just become, uh, you, you know, if somebody wants to get you to do something different. It's like, yeah, but I need my routines. I need my Mm. softness. I need all my cush. And it's like, 
you know, so I just think it's good to, to push yourself a little bit and find ways to do things that are hard. So how did you come to making wildness and this, this, uh, idea of rewilding yourself part of your, uh, your career? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Cause I was like avoiding a career, uh, for a long time. And, uh, I got real, I, I gotta say like a lot of, for me, what's happened, you know, I was talking before about knowing when to walk away from things or knowing when things aren't right. That's part of the science of luck. You know what I mean? Like there's like an art and science to luck and being in the right place at the right time. Mm. And in order to be at the right place, at the right time, you can't be in the wrong place. That's by nature, not the right place at the right yes. time. So by knowing where not to be, I've often been in the right place at the right time. And one of the right places and right times I was in was the beginning of YouTube. And uh, like, I've never been some big YouTube celebrity. I just got videos out on YouTube when YouTube was a pretty new thing. And it got some attention. Not big, but you don't need a lot of attention, especially back then. You didn't need a lot of attention in order for to start developing a readership or a listenership or a followership or whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. So um, I got some videos out on YouTube uh, probably about 12, 13 years ago. And, uh, and people kind of latched onto them and they liked them. And they started inviting me to, to give talks. And what was interesting to me at the time was – I was really, I'd been really into nutrition for a long time and, um, I was starting to get interested in wild foods. When you look at wild foods nutritionally, man, they are not the same animal as the foods in our supermarket. You know, it's fascinating world. You're looking at far more nutrition, um, like significantly more nutrition, particularly when you look at phytonutrients, like antioxidants and things like that. You look at a wild plant compared to the domesticated counterpart. It's like night and day. Uh, my friend Alan says it's real plants doing real plant things. Hmm. You know, if you think about uh, a plant that's raised in a garden, it's exactly what we've been talking about. Real plants who do real plant things are dealing with wind, rain, insects that are herbivorous that are trying to feed on it, animals that are trying to feed on it, right? Like conditions too hot. Now it's dry. It's drought, crappy soil. Like they're dealing with all of these tough conditions and competition from other species that want that space that they're in, competing for light, competing for soil nutrients. So they must be really tough. Here they are. Part, Part of that toughness is that they produce chemicals to defend themselves. Turns out those chemicals are medicine for us. So, and, and this is pretty universally true because, you know, you think about pharmaceutical drugs, they're most of them, the greater proportion of them have been derived from plant-based substances, right? So most of our pharmaceutical drugs, I think it's last I heard it was like 70 plus percent uh, come from or synthesized or taken directly from plant drugs or plant medicines. Well, in the plant, those are defenses against issues in their environment, mm-hmm. right? When you take that plant, and you put it in a garden and you curate perfect soil for it and you put a fence around it and you make sure you water it every day so it's like this artificially perfect climate, perfect conditions. It's like the trust fund kid. No hardship. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to deal with any challenges in its environment and somebody's always there to wipe its bottom and pet its head, right? And so it grows into a big, beautiful plant, but it lacks all of those nutrients and all those phytochemicals that would be in the wild plant because it's not having to defend itself, Mm -hmm. right? So the plant chemicals are sort of the equivalent of like the muscles you'd build strength training. These plants aren't having to do it, so they make less of it, right? So the plants that we got raised eating, like they're very weak and they don't pass on nearly as much of the nutrition and they don't fortify us against our environment with the antioxidants and other phytonutrients that we need. So I got really interested in that idea. And the more I thought about it, the more I was looking for allegory around that. And I got very interested in the idea of the wolf and the dog. Um, you're probably familiar, but all domesticated dogs around the world are all gray wolves. I mean, that's just like a really wait, fascinating- wait. What, what do you, Can you rephrase that? Yep, yep. Every single dog, Okay. like pet dog. So think about all the breeds. There's like more than 500 breeds. Mm-hmm. But they're all the same species. They're not they different from, species. They're all yeah, one yeah. species. They're called Canis lupus familiaris. Okay. This is a trinomial name. So when you have a Latin trinomial, that's because you've got, as opposed to a binomial, two mm-hmm. names, by Trinomial usually designates you're talking about a subspecies. So God. the gray wolf is called Canis lupus. The domesticated dog is Canis lupus familiaris, the familiar gray wolf, the, ah. the domesticated dog. 
that's why all the dogs can breed. They're not different species, right? Yeah. So when you think about some of the really ab- ab- like ab- aberrations of the wolf genome, like you think about a pug, it's a very strange looking gray wolf, right? right. <laughs> you think about like a minpin, a chihuahua, a shih tzu, like these are all gray wolves. And, and you can, this is, you know, there's a lot of species we could talk about that are like this. Like our plants are like this too. I mean, when you look at a wild lettuce, you're like, really? That's where lettuce comes from? Because mm-hmm. what we turn lettuce into is so different in the garden space because we've domesticated it. Anyway, it's really think, interesting, interesting when you think about, and think about dogs because they are gray wolves and they need all the things gray wolves need. But domestication has changed them so much and in many ways weakened them so much right? That now they are reliant on us. I love dogs. I, I love the human dog relationship. This is not, I have a dog sitting right over here. It's not a, a slight against dogs, mm-hmm. but it, I do want to point out my dog doesn't know how to live without me. Mm-hmm. Whereas a gray wolf certainly does. And so I got really interested in that. Well, that got me thinking about, well, like, what about people? Are we domesticated? And then I started thinking about like indigenous people in the world. You know, there are something like a hundred uncontacted tribes still in the world. You know that island off the coast of India? Have you been hearing about that where that uh, missionary died recently? I don't think so. I can't think of the name of it right now. I wish I had it off the top of my head. Um, There's an island off the coast of India where they are considered a sovereign territory. So um, you can't go there. Wow. But when people do try to go there, they always get killed because these people kill them with archery tackle. Uh, so recently, there's one really funny story from the past where some people went there and they dropped off some pigs um, as like an offering on the island to say, hey, you know, we're, we're, we come in peace, here's a gift. And the uh, islanders came out and they slaughtered the pigs and buried them and then had a big orgy in front of the missionaries like on the beach, you know. Holy this is pr- shit. It's a pretty hardcore story. Anyway, um, <laughs> there, are, there are tribes in the Amazon, there are peoples in Africa, there's peoples in Indonesia that are still living in so-called the Stone Age. Mm -hmm. right? In other words, they don't smelt metals. They are still stone age peoples. Mm -hmm. They uh, still hunt and gather. They are not in contact. They know we're out here for sure, but they're not in contact with us, right? They would represent in all sort of, by all biological standards, wild people. Does that make sense? Just like the gray wolf is the wild form of the dog. Now, if you think about like, if you got gray wolves was your standard and then you got all the sort of dogs together, you'd be like, well, some dogs kind of look like gray wolves and some dogs really don't anymore. And if you like grabbed a whole bunch of people from the city, you'd be like, oh yeah, we do have like a lot of variation as we've domesticated ourselves. We've become many different shapes and forms and sizes and you know, we are the domesticated form. Domestication means of the house. And interestingly, if you think about the French word for wild is sauvage which is why they were calling indigenous people savages. It means wild people, savage, mm. right? Savage. So, savage sounds so much nicer. Isn't it nicer? Yeah, I know, <laughs> something about French. Anyway, I think that's you know, a very derogatory term for, for these people. I don't know, when yeah. I say wild people, I do not mean it in that way because I, I deeply, deeply respect these people. In fact, I think right now we're at the most kind of critical moment in human history since probably since the first seed was planted in the agricultural revolution 14,000 years ago, or, or give or take, whenever that happened. Uh, we're at the point now where the last indigenous people are going to be dying out. Mm-hmm. The last, I shouldn't say indigenous people, the last indigenous people living in their traditional life way are going to die out. And it's like, what would it mean for dogs if the last gray wolf died? That would mean there was no road back. Do you see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. That's a big deal. Like if all the dogs died tomorrow of some dog disease, There'd be gray wolves. You could be like, well, let's make some more dogs. Now, this is this has happened with some species. So if you think about cows, bows, taurus, they come from this animal called the auroch. This was a bison-like animal oh, wow. with massive lateral horns that lived in Eurasia. And we domesticated cattle out of that. But that animal went extinct in the 1600s. We hunted them to extinction. Mm-hmm. Now all that's left is cows. Now you can't make cows back into that, and they have tried. Yeah. The Nazis tried it, which is a really weird whole side story. Um, in their kind of creepy eugenics program, they they wanted to see if they could do it. But anyway, mm-hmm. it turns out you can't do it. So what's happened now is cows exist in this weird nebulous place where only the domesticated form is still extant. And so we have become responsible. I like to joke with vegans like, well, okay, so let's stop killing cows. What do we do with them? Put them in the zoo? Because if we stop raising There's them, a lot of cows out there, they'll go extinct. 
their yeah. genes will disappear from the earth because there's no wild form left. Do you know what I mean? It's really weird. And that's about to happen to us. Our wild form will disappear. Well, I started looking at wild peoples and sort of studying a little bit about how they live and, and what their health outcomes are. And it's real, real fascinating because they don't have the diseases we have. They just simply don't suffer from cancer, diabetes, heart disease, like the things that are killing us. They don't mm -hmm. really exist in those cultures. Disease is massively suppressed. Lifespans can be a bit shorter, but mostly because of child mortality is higher. That brings the average, the average down, yeah. down. And then when we look historically, there's always this thing, well, we used to live to 35. Well, it turns out, you know that when you date a skeleton, you can't date it past 55 years. Hmm. So when they dig up, that's like the max age they'll give a skeleton in an archaeological dig. Hmm. So when you add child mortality and you add that low age in, blah, 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 you get this low average, which isn't really true. Humans have, but animals in a zoo live longer. They do, right? So I was just reading about pigeons this week. It's like pigeons live in the wild like three years old, but they can be like 14 in a zoo. So you got to wow. ask yourself this question, like what's better, 14 years in captivity or three years of freedom? This is an interesting question, you know? But anyway, that's a side note. I got really fascinated by the fact that indigenous people had these really amazing health outcomes. Where they're most significantly different is that they don't have the mental illness that we have. And how's that being studied? Oh, anthropologists have been studying this for a long time. Yeah, this is this is actually extremely well established. In fact, mm -hmm. they talk about the transition from um, hunting and gathering to agriculture as, as the biggest mistake in human history. Jared mm -hmm. Diamond was probably the most well known for this, but they, I mean, you get on Google Scholar and you just start looking at studies about this. I mean, it's just like a well established idea in anthropology that indigenous peoples have better mental health outcomes and physical health outcomes than us. And that on average, they have the musculature of our Olympic athletes just from living. I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. fascinating thing. Okay. You start looking at that and then it gets to this like question like, well, can we still living in a modern life do things that give us some of that? And I think that we touch on that in all like the hacking, biohacking and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of what we're doing. When we're hacking something, all we're really doing is giving ourselves the biological things that we, they like to think like we're cracking the code of like something, it's something scientific. It's usually that it's something biologically relevant. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times what we're actually doing is like giving your dog the conditions a gray wolf would have. Like what happens if you take your dog and you feed it the food of a gray wolf and you make sure it gets the exercise of a gray wolf and it gets the pack encounters of a gray wolf and all those things. You'll have a happier, healthier, well-adjusted dog. I mean, people have their dogs on Prozac now. You know what I mean? So Damn. I got really. Oh, you didn't know that? Damn, Antidepressants no. for dogs? Yeah, it's a whole thing. Damn. Anyway, so I got really interested in the idea of rewilding ourselves. Um, and that, I, got, I podcasted about that for several years, as you were mentioning before. Um, and finally got to the point where it got to be so um, intellectual. And all of the little hacking tricks, you know, have mm. you gone down that road very much where it's like- Not before? much. I've never, okay. I've never it can get been pretty real weird. into it. it can get I've, pretty I've done weird, a couple you know? pieces of technology and nootropics and stuff like that, but I don't know. I, I never took yeah. to it much. It, I got friends who it's like, man, I mean, the, the amount of stuff they have to bring around with them to, yeah, yeah. to maintain it all, it gets pretty cumbersome and ridiculous. So I finally said to myself after all these years of podcasting about this and exploring this idea, I was like, I need to get like grounded again. And what out of this is the most meaningful thing to me? And it was the idea of like, well, can I hunt and gather for my food in the modern world? And that's what I've been doing now for the last several years. And uh, that's been my main focus. So by doing that, I get the time in the outdoors. I get the physical exertion. I get relationship with the elements. I get probably what I think is the most significant thing, which is relationship with lots of different species. So, you know, one of the things that I think people are really missing in their lives is they only have relationships with other human persons and maybe domesticated dogs or cats. Otherwise, they're so cut off from the natural world that, and this has never happened in history before. This is a completely new phenomenon. When in history has people been this divorced from other species? Normally, you should probably know something like two to 500 species. Think about that. Like if you just lived as a natural person in, in a natural environment, mm -hmm. you would know 100 plus plants. 
very intimately. You would know like we eat this one and this one and this one and this one seeds and this one when it's a young shoot and the fruits of this one. This one we use for medicine. This one we use for medicine. That one's a poison, but we use it to kill fish or that one's a poison, but we use that on our arrow tips or, you know what I mean? You'd know all these different plants. You'd know lichens. You'd know algae. You'd know fungi. You'd know lots of animal species. They would be mammals. They would be birds. They would be amphibians, right? They would be reptiles. You would hunt lots of different ones. You would know so many species that when you stepped outside, well, I guess you lived outside. So when you would walk through your environment, you would be like walking through school when you were in high school and you just knew everybody. Yeah. And you're not like walking by like necessarily saying hi to everybody, but you just are recognizing these are all touch points in your network that you have. So a natural person would move through the environment just with the comfort of knowing kind of everything around them at a pretty intimate level. Now, most of people today, you take them outside and they can do only like the, the broadest brush strokes, broadest brush strokes. They could be like, that's a tree. That's mm -hmm. a bird. You're like, well, what tree? What bird? And most people just don't know. And this is not their fault. It's how we have raised ourselves in isolation from nature. So I sometimes joke around that if you took an indigenous person from one of these uncontacted tribes, and you took an astronaut who went to the moon, and then you took a person on a backpacking trip into the mountains, and you put them in the middle, do they look more like the astronaut or more like the indigenous person with all their gear and equipment and clothes and boots? And they look more like the astronaut. When we go into the natural world, very often we go into it as if it's a foreign planet. Like we need life support because we don't mm -hmm. know anything about that place. That's like pretty frightening that we've gotten to the point where we treat our planet like we're on the moon or like we're visiting Mars, you know, because we're just not familiar with what's there. Right. So, you know, at this point, and it's only been for me, I've been really hardcore about this for like half a decade. So not really very long at all. But uh, when I walk through the environment, it's like, those are oak trees. I get my acorns from those that I process into flour. Those are maple trees. I make all my, yeah, those are my buds. I make all my sugar from these maple trees. You know, I use this plant and that plant and that plant and that plant and this one flowers then and this one fruits then. And, and I, I see all these friends. Now, there's a lot of species I don't know, more that I don't know than I do know, but enough that I know that I feel anti-fragile. Because if you remember anti-fragile in that book, he's talking about it's not just that you are resistant and resilient to breakdown. It's that when things break down, you excel past everyone else. That's anti-fragile. So it's like for me, if everything crumbled around, I would actually do better than I am now. And I'm fairly successful mm -hmm. now. My life's good. But I would even be better because I would right. be able to utilize all these skills. you know. And while, that, while the world isn't like that, I still benefit from all of these things. So right now, um, my, my, the thrust of my work is getting people acquainted or, get, or, or creating interest in wild places and wild species. Because I think of all of the things that I explored around human wildness, and I did kind of explore everything from sex and birth and death and drugs and you know all these community and all these aspects of it, food, what felt like the most valuable thing to me was hunting and gathering in the modern world. Because... I just don't think people are ever going to really start to protect wild places and protect open spaces until they have a vested interest in something they take from that place and that landscape. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like when you see this thing of like um, carbon offset credits, so you'll see yes. like, you'll see like a company's like, well, what we want to do is go in and destroy this forest. So what we're going to do is invest in this forest over here, right? And that just balances it right out. It's like, doesn't work for me if I deer hunt in there and that's where I get my mushrooms and yeah. that's where I get my acorns. Like, please, I don't want you to do that. I have a vested interest in protecting that place. Mm. But if I don't have any real relationship to the natural world and when I say I care about the environment, quote unquote, I just mean it in like a vague, I want to feel good about myself way. Like, oh yeah, I care about the environment. So often I'll be like, I'll push people on that. Like, what environment do you care about? Like, what part of the environment? What what place? What biome? What where? Show me a physical location that you're invested in? Or do you just mean the environment like, like world peace? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like hunting and gathering puts you so deeply and intimately. My friend Arthur Haynes talks about this. He says like, he's like, we think of sex as intimate. He's like, well, what's more intimate than food? Like you actually put it inside your body and then you make your cells out of it. Like eating is the most intimate <laughs> yeah. act, right? So yeah. if, I, if, I, if my body is made out of a place, then I want to protect that place. And so hunting and gathering at first looks like just this food thing, which is cool. It's great. It's free range, beyond organic. It's like, 
you know, all the kind of good things, right? You can put all those cool labels on it, but it goes so much deeper philosophically because it mm. rewilds you. It creates a ne- an anti-fragile network of species that you're interconnected to, and it deeply, deeply invests you in place. So we have this, this saying here at, at my company, it's like being made of place. Being made of place. Yeah, versus being made of like, what's the average person made from? Like if we were going to a city, it's like, well, my water comes from Fiji, so my blood is right. like Fijian, right? My apples come from Chile. You know, my my meat, my beef comes from New Zealand. You know what I mean? You start to look, it's like, oh, you're made out of like, a, you're a cachet of all this stuff from all over the world that's been shipped all over the place, blah, 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 but mm-hmm. none of it, like none from here. And right. that's why the local food movement's so cool, but it's like you can go so deep and uh, kind of like the idea of drawing people a little bit further along that journey. What do you, what do you think are the most approachable uh, first steps for people to take down this path and what value do you think those steps bring? Um, kind of like tangible values. Yeah. So you could like um, start with like a plant walk where you live. And I mean, this is everywhere because like they even do it in New York City, right? There's wild food walks in New York City. And you learn like one plant. Like you learn a weed in your yard and you learn how you food walk. A food walk would be like um, you go out with somebody who's a forager and they lead a group of you through town or through your neighborhood or through a forest and they teach you about different plants and how you can use them, let's say, or mushrooms or whatever it is. The hunting world lacks this. We do need a lot more mentorship in the hunting and fishing world for people who are not raised in it. That's it's. I think it's a it's a big um, opportunity there because it's fairly wide open still. But it's very common in the plant mushroom world for people who want to learn about these things that you you kind of like find a, a local plant walk you could do, mm-hmm. uh, and you go out and you and you meet a couple of plants. And I say meet it because these are like non-human persons because they're alive. And if they're alive, then they would be entities, right? And if they're entities, then they're beings. And if they're beings, then they have personhood, even if they're not human. So a dandelion is like a non-human person. And you can meet it and face-to-face mm-hmm. and see it in a way like you never saw it before and develop relationship to it. And maybe you actually do that intimate act I was talking about and bring it into your body and then make, make some of your cells out of it. And maybe you use it as a medicine because it's incredible for cleansing your kidneys and your liver, you know, in addition to being super nutritive, like beyond kale nutritive, Mm -hmm. right? And you learn like, it's not food all the time. Like, when is it food? And somebody shows you about that and you learn like one thing. And now when you're driving around, you see them everywhere and you're doing like, what's up, bud? Like, I know you, right? And that's like one. And then maybe you add one other thing, like whatever it is, you know, maybe it's a plant, maybe it's an animal. As you start to develop a relationship with species, maybe it's a mushroom. And piece by piece, you know, you can like, for me, it's like I just try to add a couple a year, you know? Mm-hmm. And before mm-hmm. you know it, you have this like quiver full of arrows, essentially. You have this like portfolio of species that you have connection to. You this know? is coming this is coming together for me um, in a way it hasn't before. It seems like like when I go when I move to a new city, I always feel like a little uncomfortable driving around at first. But then as I get more and more used to it, I feel like it's my home, right? Mm-hmm. And I think this sounds like it could take that to an entirely another level. You, you just nailed it because it's like, it's your home. Again, people treat earth like it's a, f- if they're not in their urban environment, they think of earth as this place where you need to bring life support everywhere. Right. Like you're not from here. Out in nature. That's really scary to me. If you don't think you're from here, then where are you from? Mm-hmm. You know, like, where are we from? Like, heaven? (laughs) Like, are we angels or apes? Like, where are we from? Uh, So like you just said, like you go to a new place, but you're like, nah, but I know that plant. I know that tree, you know? And piece by piece, you start to develop these relationships. Now, uh, I'm not uh, comfortable to say that I do this as a subsistence thing because it's like, uh, there are people, like we were talking about uncontacted tribes, it's true subsistence. They live this way. Without it, they die. That's not me. Without this, I go down to the supermarket. I buy something. You know, I'm like, fine. There's, I have money and food all around me, and I'm not like in a place where I have to do this to live. I don't think of it as a sport or a hobby, though. That cheapens it to a point that I just grosses me out almost. Yeah. Like, I really don't. I'm not comfortable with hunting as a sport. It's like really gross to me. It's like, oh man, like that's your sport. Like, dude, throw a frisbee, dude. Um, yeah, you know. These are living creatures we're talking about. Like, have some respect, you know? Um, 
I think of it as a practice. So just like yoga, just like meditation, right? Those are things we don't consider people. You're not like, oh, you do yoga as a sport. That's not how we talk about yoga, right? And it's more than a well, hobby. Well, it depends if you're going to core power. Okay, or something all right, else. good point. Good point. Meditation. All right, but you yeah. you get where I'm coming from. Like we also don't think of it as just really a hobby either, because it's got a spiritual right. connotation to it. Uh, used to, I know. Yeah, yoga has become a kind of a silly thing, but you know what I'm talking about. So I think of this as a practice. I don't have to do this, and it's also not my sport. It's my practice. I do it because it creates relationship with the natural world. And I think if I was going to bring everything full circle, we talked about today. Part of that is that it's healing to the trauma that I went through as a child. So that's how I would tie a bow on. It's like my practice of hunting and gathering restores my place of belonging in the world because I see that I am part of, I am like no different than these animals living with the earth. I am another predatory species. I'm also a species that benefits other species and creates habitat. I help to maintain the balance. You know, I love the idea in the um, Judeo-Christian tradition that human beings are like naturally gardeners of the wild environment. You know, like we're stewards of the wild environment. It's kind of like mm -hmm. we were placed in a garden, so to speak, you know, metaphorically. And uh, so I, li I'd ra I like that position, you know, being there is restorative to me. So mm -hmm. um I, it's not necessarily for everybody, but at the same time, we need to stop going around being like, oh, we're destroying the environment without, I mean, where are some, please, some solutions, people? What are some solutions? Because all this yeah. stuff of like, oh, you're going to drive a smart car. So it's just the same polluting car, it's just smaller. We're like, I'm going to drive an electric car. It's like, oh, okay, the same exact thing. It just runs on energy that comes from a nuclear power plant instead of from fossil fuel. What the fuck are we talking about? This is the same stuff. This is not a solution. You, you, my friend jokes about this. He says like, that's just less bad. It's still bad. It's just mm -hmm. less bad than the other thing. Or it's like, if you're going, one way we'll talk about it is like, if you're trying to get to Canada, right? And you're driving towards Mexico, it's like, will slowing down ever get you to Canada? It's like, if you're destroying the environment, will de destroying the environment more slowly ever help you restore the environment? No. The smart car is a... It's, right. it's a slower trip to Mexico, but it's never going to get you to Canada. Like we need real solutions. And those solutions mm. come from people having relationships with the things that we are destroying. So if you don't actually know any animals and know any plants and know any fungi or any of that, and you don't really spend time in any nature places that aren't ultra curated by, you know, corporations who are just trying to make a buck off you. And that's your experience of nature, right? It's like resorts. If that's all you know of nature, then how can you ever really start to care about it and protect mm -hmm. it? And so, mm -hmm. in other words, I when I hear the news and I hear the things we're saying about the environment, it's like, what a joke. What a joke, man. Nobody's really doing anything. You know, legislating about, it's like, it's not going to come from that. It's going to come from people <laughs> actually creating connection to place, being made Dude. of place. I'm feeling super inspired. Um, yeah, w one thing that really resonates with me is your the the topic of getting getting familiar with death and and remembering your mortality. It reminds me a little. Uh, I mean, uh, the Stoics, I'm sure, get it get it from more of what you're talking about. But the Stoics are really big in uh, this idea of negative visual visualization and considering death and considering what might happen if we lose the things that really matter to us. And it's just so obvious that that through hunting and having a, a closer relationship with nature, you just you're constantly confronted with all of that. And so it seems like you can be you can give yourself permission to just be present because you know, your life is, is it's going to, it's going to end one day and you only have one of them. And so you better, better make the most of it and treat the things around you and the, the entities, as you put it with respect. And when you're around something really beautiful or inspiring, you can take that in more fully. You know what I mean? You can really appreciate mm -hmm. it because you have contrast. Yeah. So it's like, Oh, I'm really lucky. Oh, this is really mm -hmm. beautiful. This is a moment that I will care about on my deathbed rather than just being constantly caught up in thought and Pushing trying to it. earn more stuff. Like I was saying the other day, you know, I'm out canoeing with my wife on this. It's a beautiful, perfect fall day. We are, everything is so gorgeous. I mean, it's like the perfect blue sky, puffy white clouds. 
it, little sparkles of sunlight coming through the canopy. And it's like this moment I'm thinking, savor this, man. Like, cause in my head, you know, I'm thinking about, yeah, like what you're saying, like what I got to do this week, what work do I have ahead? What are we looking for? Why are we out here? All, all this stuff. And it's like, no, stop. Like just this moment is the kind of like, this would be a perfect moment to hold on to in that last moment of my life. Like if this was mm -hmm. my last moment, this would be a great moment. And so it's like, it starts to crack through and you realize like, oh, when you have that, savor that, hold on to that. That's the really juicy stuff, you know? But you know, if you don't have contrast, then you, you don't know. I've got a couple more questions for you and we'll get out of here. Uh, I can't end this interview without talking to you about dri you driving your car with night vision goggles and the rest of your, <laughs> your Jason Bourne antics. T tell me about this like alter ego you have, man. Yeah, I do have that. Um, yeah, I, you know, I had this moment, you know, I talked about knowing when to walk away and uh, I had this contract with the Navy when I was 18. I was going to I was going to join, but I had to sign a six year contract instead of a four because I wanted an opportunity to go to Bud's, which is like that Navy school. You yep. know, it's like an opportunity. You know, you don't know what happens. It's just an opportunity. And I, that was like a dream of mine. And uh, I got really into like the kind of things we're talking about. I started getting into nutrition and health and I started realizing, wow, these two paths are not yeah. congruous. You know, if I go down this road, I'm going to get, I'm going to be inoculated, drugged, beat up, like kind of come out broken by the time I'm 25. You know what I mean? Uh, and I'm going to get even more traumatized, but I love, possibly. Yeah. I want, yeah. And I have tremendous respect for those folks. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I love the opportunity to train with those folks as well. So I never did that. I, I walked away from it. And, uh, but I always had this like nagging thing. Cause I really wanted to, it wasn't necessarily the work as much as I really enjoy training and things. And I really wanted mm -hmm. to do it. So I and have the challenge, man, the yeah, challenge yeah, of buds is exactly. so attractive. It's very cool. Right. So yeah, I know I, I think of like the seals are kind of like our national football team or something. You know what I mean? They're like, yes. it's funny how they, how we see them. But anyway, I was really attracted to the special ops kind of training world. And so I, basically we're in this really unique opportunity right now. A lot of civilian people don't know this, but because we've been at war for 20 years, we have so many people who are high level operators who've come back and opened schools. And so we're kind of in a similar situation, like when Japan was coming out of the feudal kind of system and all these, you know, I don't know, quote unquote samurai were teaching martial arts schools. They had martial arts schools, right? It's like you could go and learn that stuff. So it's like that now where you can go kind of learn a, a quite a crazy variety of things. So I have had the opportunity, you know, on my own dime, just as my hobby. So this is my like mm -hmm. side hobby, or you said like alter ego. Man, I've done kind of a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of shooting uh, ARs and, and Glocks are what I shoot. Um, uh, everything from, you know, concealed carry work to like team stuff. I've done like multi-day training events where we take down a, you know, we, we plan and then take down a building and you have oppositional force. So you're shooting your guns, but set up to shoot a paint cartridge, but out of a real right. firearm, you know, so, um, force on force training I've done. Uh, I got into a class that the DOD holds down in, uh, near Washington, D.C., which was an um, offensive driving course, you know, where I got to crash through barriers and pit cars and, you know, shoot from vehicles and all Damn. those kind of things. Like operating with night vision, with thermal imagery, you know, uh, shooting suppressed weapons, shooting machine guns. I, I mean, I've just learning to pick locks, learning to escape and evade. I've done classes where you are uh, being chased by bounty hunters in the city, you know, for a couple of days and you have to use oh, all that's these, amazing. you know, so just like I have chased that stuff for a lot of years and now I don't do as much of it, but like at least once a year, I make sure to do another course and just kind of keep that skill set really sharp. And, uh, because, you know, we live in this really interesting world where it's like, there's the wild world, our environment, and then there's the urban world, which is the environment we mostly are in. And to me, those skills are the skills of being able to operate in the urban environment uh, primarily. Right. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like to, I like to be really fit for that environment, just like I like to be really fit for the wild environment. So yeah, I'm just fascinated by all that stuff and, you know, deep into the medical side of it, emergency medicine, trauma medicine. So I've held the EMT license a bunch of times and done firefighting classes, water rescue classes, you know, just kind of anything that, that all of those like military police firefighter skill sets, I just, you can get out there and get involved in those. I mean, it's amazing how open that world is. And so, uh, yeah, I, that's my side hobby. 
That's badass, dude. And and another thing that's super valuable in all of this is I'm sure it makes you feel young. Like the, mm-hmm. all of that shit sounds so fun, man. Yeah. Um, I have a habit of playing uh, this game called Spike Ball. Have you seen it? Mm-mm. No. What is it? It's uh, similar rules to volleyball for uh, two on two. Uh, it's just a it's just an incredible game. I do that. I go jump off of bridges into water all over the place yeah. or cliffs. And it just oh, makes I hate me that. feel I'm younger, scared of man. That. I'm scared of that. Uh, <laughs> that's cool, though. I was like, when I watch people jump from heights, I'm always like, man, I just don't have that. I don't, I don't have that like internally. Um, yeah, ch- ch- I wonder. Me I do it. I think. Yeah, I think you have. There's a there's a, some level of you have to have done a lot of it as a kid, and mm-hmm. if not, like maybe you can start. Maybe you can start really <laughs> slow, but I that's think it. it's one of those things you have that's to like. Ner- you have to neurologically train yourself yeah. to. Yeah. But I do think like to kind of back to what you're saying is like, it's important that you are constantly immersing yourself in unknown things and learning new complex skill sets and particularly Mm -hmm. that require the use of your body. So I think Mm -hmm. it's, it's really important like that we develop new kinesthetic um, imprinting all the time. And so like one of the things I was talking before about shooting is like weapons manipulation under stress, like teaching your body to do new things under stress, uh, mm-hmm. trauma medicines like this. And I'm sure jumping off of bridges like this because you're afraid, but you have to do certain things with your body. So I think that stuff, like you said, talking about keeping you young is like making sure that you're doing new um, psychokinesthetic things all the time and challenging yourself in new ways. Because most of the people I know who are aged but young uh, do new things all the time. And most of the people mm-hmm. I know who are young but already gotten old, it's because they just kind of got good at one thing and that's all they do now. And they, they're right. afraid to step out. So, you know, I like pushing myself into new things. Oh, it's badass, dude. I love it. Tell me about uh, the Wild Fed TV show. Yeah, so this is like my passion project right now. I'm working really hard on it. I have been for two years. Um, I have been filming a show, as, as you mentioned, it's called Wild Fed. And the premise of the show is every episode, I, I'm the host, but we, we feature a lot of really amazing people in the show. Every episode, we go out and we gather some protein. So we might hunt or fish or uh, what anthropologists would call collect. Let's say that it was going to be insects or clams or something like that. It's not really hunting, but we go out and get some animal. And then we also go out and we get some uh, vegetable or fungi. So it might be a mushroom, it might be a plant. And we go out on those adventures and we, we get all this food together. And then we bring that back. You, sometimes I do the cooking and other times we work with chefs and we'll bring those ingredients to them. And then they'll turn that into a meal. And then everybody who's involved in the hunt or in the forage comes together and we have a meal. Uh, and you know, sometimes the, the plant turns into a centerpiece. Sometimes the plant is in a cocktail. You know, sometimes the animals, the big focus of the show, sometimes it's less of a focus, but it's always like those components. Mm -hmm. Um, And our tagline for Wild Fed is food is all around you. And the idea is we want people to see everything from exotic hunts to stuff that's like surprisingly right in your backyard that you can do. Because I really want to inspire people to get out and do more of these things like we're talking about. Um, So I've been recording podcast episodes and making shows. And right now I have filmed the entire season one, which is eight episodes. And then I've got uh, five episodes of season two done. And uh, just getting ready to go film uh, episode six. And we're shopping that around right now. So I'm not sure when that's going to come out, but I mean, it's going to be in the next year. You know, it's like uh, just a matter of where we're going to debut it and where it's going to live. Um, but uh, so the show and podcast and, you know, the rest of that media is going to be coming pretty soon. I'm just really pumped about it. It's, it's, a, it's a new uh, format for me, a new mm-hmm. medium doing that kind of uh, television style show. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. I got a great team and, um, yeah, we just have awesome content in a kind of a new genre. You know, we are sort of opening totally, up a new man. genre. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't think of anyone who's doing this in a big way like that. Mm-hmm. There's definitely stuff that's, uh, you know, we can look at and kind of go, well, there's that's sort of similar and that's sort of similar. But, um, I don't think that the, I don't think media has fairly portrayed the world of foraging yet ever. Um, and I think a lot of times shows lean really heavy on crisis, you know, it's like all those Alaska shows where you get to see right. some hunting and foraging, but it's, it's like, dun, dun, dun. So if people can't relate to like wh- how or why they might want to right. tune into this for themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, networks have gotten this idea in their head that everybody's low IQ, you know, and so they mm. make stuff for the lowest denominator. So we're making something smart. We're making something beautiful. 
um, but we're also making it entertaining and energetic too. So I, I'm striking what I feel is the right balance of all those things. Mm -hmm. I'm just, we'll see how the audience likes it, but, uh, but that's what I'm, I'm real busy with right now. I've been birthing this thing for a couple of years and that's why I stopped my last podcast and that's been my main focus, you know, ah, got it. Got together. it. Mm -hmm. It's coming together. Tell, tell, tell everybody about your, uh, the, what you had at your wedding, the food at your wedding. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. My wedding's actually episode four, I think episode five, episode five of my first season, you see the wedding because I go out at the beginning of that episode, um, on a commercial lobster boat and I put in a couple days of work, um, in, you so know, cool. as a third man on a lobster boat, you get about 10% of the catch when they sell it. And I said, well, I'd, I don't want to sell it. I want 10% of the lobsters we catch. Mm -hmm. So I brought all those lobsters back for my wedding. So we had just hundreds of lobsters. And I mean, enough lobsters that after I had about 40 people at the wedding and there was probably 20, 30 lobsters left over the next day. Jesus. You know what I mean? It's like everybody ate lobsters till they couldn't. Um, deer that I'd hunted uh, <laughs> turned into tartare and turned into uh, like a I can't even remember now, but we did a big venison dish and then we had um, fish tacos. I like to go um, ground fishing, so offshore fishing for haddock, pollock, cod. And so we had fish tacos as well. So um, I was able to provide a, the food for the wedding uh, or at least all the protein for the wedding. And that was really cool. So, and we had other wild food friends of, of mine, you know, who brought like wild berry meads and things like that. So we had this like wild food spread and I'm talking like, cause I, I think big focus for wild fed as well is that I think a lot of times people imagine that if you were going to eat foraged food, that it's like not going to be that good. And that's all mm -hmm. just going to be like granola or something, you know? So I like to put out these, and a big part of the food component of the show is, is people seeing food that they're like, damn. I want to eat that. That's like, yes, that's yes. like, you know, Michelin star food right there. So, you know, I, we, we fed people the stuff they really wanted to eat. It was awesome. Um, so, you know, that the wedding was really cool as well. So people get to like a little glimpse of that in the episode. That's awesome, dude. Um, Daniel, thank you so much for your time, brother. Uh, thank you for helping us as a community get back to Canada at some point. Uh, and thank you for the way that you, like the passion that just seeps through in what you're doing and the humor you bring to it and everything that you're up to, man. I really appreciate you. Hey, Where can thanks. people find out more about you and keep up to date and um, know when that TV show is coming out? I am uh, most active on Instagram where I massively abuse the format to write yes, you do. extremely long and thought out posts. If you want to uh, read 15 minute posts with beautiful <laughs> pictures, head to it. Yeah, I uh, I definitely enjoy that format. It's like haiku, you know, you're forced into, you know, uh, I like this idea, um, the idea that words, that meaning builds up in a word like water behind a dam, right? So Ooh. like how much meaning can you pack into how little space? That's the yeah, art form yeah. of that medium for me. Um, so I, I write I there. I see how you're doing that as yeah, well. Yeah, thank That's you. great. So, so uh, uh, you know, people can check out my Instagram at Daniel Vitalis. And, um, but of course, you know, I have stuff on all of the platforms and uh, wild-fed.com. They can see the trailer for the show. Uh, so please go check that out. Um, and, uh, and yeah, if you Google me, you'll find all my stuff. Badass. Daniel, thanks again, man. Thanks for having me, man. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.